This is Rice and Beans. Welcome back. This is week number two. We're very excited to have a special guest with us here today. His name is AJ. AJ, where are you from? Hi, y'all. So I'm AJ. Um, I'm a senior here at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm initially from Alaska, although that's super complicated because I was actually born way back in Indiana, in the middle of the Midwest. And when I was growing up, I actually grew up in Texas, in Galveston and then San Antonio. And then my parents, well, my dad was either he was in the military, so he moved around a lot. Mm-hmm. And so we actually spent most of my like zero to eighteen years in Alaska, and then I came here to Hopkins. And my parents, they weren't even from Indiana initially. Um, my dad is actually from Hong Kong. He spent most of his life there. Then went to Boston for college. My mm-hmm. mom grew up in New York City. Went to Boston for college. They met. I came along, and they moved over to Indiana, mm-hmm. and where I was born. And um, then I grew up basically all around the country. Wow. Um, yeah. That's very... I'm having trouble drawing a map in my head yeah. to track your location. Basically a triangle. Indiana, <laughs> Texas, Alaska. I see. So where have you spent most of your life? Um, pretty much Alaska. So Indiana was like three years, Texas was five, and then Alaska was the remaining ten. And then Hopkins here in Baltimore for about four years now. All right. Why don't we just talk about Alaska for now and we'll, yeah, we totally. can get to the other ones if we have some time. Totally. I, don't, I haven't really met anyone from Alaska yeah, before, yeah, so I, I think, think that'd be some here, nice yeah. insight. So first off, Alaska. The first thing that I think of when I think of Alaska is just ice. Yeah. So what is Alaska like? Is it just completely iced over? Is it mountains? Like, where do people live? So it's interesting because Alaska is so geographically spread out that its climate ranges dramatically from place to place. It's kind of like an octopus. And if you put your hand in kind of like a fist with your pointer and your thumb stuck out, that's kind of Alaska, specifically your right right hand. Okay. Um, And basically... Going from the westernmost tip of Alaska That's your, to the, the tip of your pointer, tip finger. of your pointer, yep, to, to the bottom of your thumb on the far uh-huh. east, it's like going essentially from San Diego to like Miami, Florida, Whoa. in the distance, and then going from north to south is like going from like North Dakota to Texas. So wow. it's huge and wide. So in the far north above the Arctic Circle, it'll be dark for mm-hmm. most of the winter, and then like basically sunny the whole summer. Yeah. And towards the south, it's actually a little more like Seattle. It's kind of rainy mm-hmm. most of the time. But there are sections that are covered in what's called permafrost, where below ground, it never unfreezes. Even Holy in cow. Yeah. Are there plants under there? Um, bacteria there and oh, stuff. But yeah, pretty much up there, it's very limited, the biodiversity. Mm-hmm. But mostly in the bacteria. Yeah, that's really interesting. And something that I think we forget as yeah. people from the not Alaska states is how yeah. big Alaska is. It's huge. Do you have a comparison? Yeah, so there's two comparisons we'd like to say in Alaska is that one is that we are technically like 20, 25, no, 40% of all of the U.S.'s geographic area. Wow. In size, yep. And we have more coastline than, than the West Coast and the East Coast combined. And <laughs> if you cut Alaska in half, Texas become the third largest state. That's absurd. Yeah. Wow. Jesus. Okay. Well, now that we have that in a perspective, there's a lot of Alaska to digest. Oh, yeah. So, literally. is there lots of space between you and your neighbor, or was there cities that people congregate? Yeah, totally. So, the five, three biggest cities in Anchorage, not in Anchorage, in Alaska are Anchorage, Fairbanks, and, um, and Juneau. Mm-hmm. And basically, those are where most people are, but um, kind of similar to New York, you have one major population center where mm-hmm. about 40% of the, of the state's population lives, and that's, so that's Anchorage. And then you've got smaller people, smaller people, smaller groups of people yeah. in Juneau, in, in Kenai, in Soldotna. Um, but most people are in Anchorage. And overall, the state has a population density of about one person per square mile. Mm-hmm. So outside Anchorage, your chance of finding someone is basically very rare. So most people actually outside Anchorage live in, like, you know, besides the towns, you've got a lot of small villages spread out around the state. Mm-hmm. To the point that for elections, oh, yeah. some people have to, they have to vote electronically. They can't even, like, because to get to the voting voting booth, they'd have to fly mm-hmm. in, like, a small plane That's or absurd. a boat. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So where did you put, where did you find yourself? Uh, I was in Anchorage. So, so you're in the, in the 40% there? Exactly. So there's I a see. huge military base in Anchorage called Joint Base Elmador Richardson. Mm-hmm. And you've got Air Force people, Army people, and my dad was a doctor in the military. So okay. we were stationed there. That's pretty sick. Yeah. That's a very interesting perspective. Alaska, what is there to do in Alaska? Um, so it's very outdoorsy, I'm sure you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, from a very young age, most of the stuff people do out, you know, do for recreation is basically hiking, fishing, hunting, mm-hmm. anything outdoorsy. Um, it's interesting because, like, we would visit relatives in the lower, 40, lower 48, is what we call the, the contiguous U.S. states. Yeah. And our friends who are our age would basically just be, like, on their phones, playing video games. But we'd be like, what are you doing? Like, we love playing outside. Because in yeah. Alaska, it's like you'd see kids everywhere outside mm-hmm. climbing trees perhaps too dangerously but yeah but I mean, yeah that's pretty cool 
it's good to be able to grow up in this giant playground of life in Alaska. Exactly. And it kind of draws your attention to that. So once you move elsewhere, if you decide to move, if you, mm-hmm. if you decide to leave it, then you're, you kind of know what's out there and where to look. Definitely. And you don't really have to go to like electronics, phones, video games since you're exactly. seeing yourself. That's pretty cool. What are, is there like a, a certain demographic, a certain type of person that lives in Alaska? So it's interesting because like ethnically Alaska tends to be pretty balanced. Um, it is about 60 to 70% white, but there still are a lot of Native Alaskans who stay in Alaska yeah. um, compared to their counterparts in, in the lower 48 states. Mm-hmm. Um, Native Alaskans actually got, ended up getting a, um, a slightly better um, like a settlement, you might call it, with, yeah, yeah. with the federal government in that um, their equivalent of reservations are actually structured kind of more like business corporations. Mm-hmm. So they, they have kind of can claim like business interest and in everything off yeah. their territories. Um, and then you also have a lot of immigrants from even like Russia and also even places in Africa because Anchorage and Alaska, because it's so far away and because mm-hmm. there's so much space, it's actually a very popular destination for resettlement um, oh, really? for a lot of Catholic refugee agencies. I see. Yeah. And even so in our main city of Anchorage, um, the student population of the school district is actually minority majority. What? Yeah. That's new. Yeah. And there's, I think there was even one study that showed that like Alaska, that Anchorage, Alaska is technically speaking by like per capita. It's like the most diverse city in the country. Really? Yeah. Huh. There's like over a hundred languages spoken in the city. What are some of the most popular languages there? Uh, so there's a lot of Hmong. Um, what is Hmong? Hmong is um, ethnicity from um, Cambodia. So people what? who just displaced are in the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Vietnamese very people, Hmong people, Cambodian people, a mm. lot of um, refugees from the 70s and 80s came to Anchorage. That's very interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. So what are some uh, Alaskan cuisine? Um, I'd so imagine it'd be very less of fish. Seafood, yeah, oh, yeah, seafood, halibut, salmon, all five varieties of salmon especially. Wow. Um, king crab. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've seen the, the show Deadliest Catch. Oh, of course. Yep. Yep. Um, what else? Moose, reindeer. What? Yes. They eat moose? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Reindeer is not safe from... Uh, Alaskan hunters. Yeah, I mean, I guess with with that kind of extreme climate, it's kind of necess- necessary. Oh yeah, definitely. I think that you know, among some of the more um, contemporary settlers, hunting is more of a sport. But for a lot of the people who have been there for decades, or if they're native Alaskan, there for centuries or millennia, mm-hmm. a lot of it's actually subsistence hunting and fishing. Yeah. So like when you're far out in like a lot of the villages, like you have to fish for your own food, hunt mm-hmm. for your own food. Yeah. So people would go to Bass Pro Shops not to get the new, not to get a new crossbow, just so they can shoot better, faster, yeah. but so that they can have a better advantage. When have it comes more to meals. Survive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's something to think about because a lot of people, when they think of hunting, they just think of the pure sport, exactly. and they forget where the roots, the purpose of hunting exactly. comes from. Exactly. So I think, yeah, Alaska does make a great example of that. Exactly. That does open our mind a little bit, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how did any Alaskan culture, any of the, the native culture, permeate into your upbringing, if, that, if at all? Um, so the cool thing about Alaska, at least in Anchorage, is that they try to integrate native Alaskan culture into the curriculum. Oh. So yeah, throughout elementary school and even middle school, um, every year during the time of the, um, I forget what they're called exactly, the um, Native Alaskan Olympic Games, they call them, mm-hmm. we would actually spend like about a quarter of the school year kind of doing that instead of, instead of like the typical basketball, football, yeah. baseball kind of sports stuff. And what does that entail? So there's these games where it's like basically they're games of like physical sports. They don't have any kind of like machinery or mm-hmm. any kind of like like rackets or balls. Basically, it's like games where you have to like there's like leg wrestling where you oh. it's just like an arm wrestling match but with your legs you lock knees and try mm-hmm. to like pull the person over. There's games where you try to like get like into a crab stance mm-hmm. and then kick this ball hanging in the air off a string. Wow. Yeah, and basically they're simulated off of actions that native Alaskans would have used to go hunting or fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in previous yeah, times. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's cool. And you, and you guys are, like, kind of obligated to get involved in that. Exactly. That's very interesting. It kind of reminds me of Texas, which is where somewhere else where you grew up, where yeah. Texas is very... They teach lots of Texas culture in their, oh, in, definitely. In their curriculum as definitely. well. But instead of going there right now, let's talk about... So you said your father's from Beijing. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, no worries. He's, so he was born there in the late 60s. Um, he has one little brother who's still there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he grew up there very academically, but then he decided in his teens that he wanted to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, he had never been one to stay in one place, and he actually hated city life. Oh, yeah? So he wanted to come to the U.S. for the, kind of like the stereotypical open expanse kind yeah. of idea. So he came to the U.S., went to Boston University, um, ended up going into aerospace engineering. Mm-hmm. Then that industry crashed in the 90s, and then going to medicine, and then ended up in the military, and then mm-hmm. met my mom. Oh, cool. Yeah. So he was there basically 
up until his college years? Yeah, he went no, until he was 18. Okay. And he never really went back since... Uh, yeah, he never really went back. He's gone back for a vacation every now and then to see relatives um, like once every five to ten years. But otherwise, he almost never goes back. Very interesting. Do you feel like you're distant from that, that culture? In a way. So when my parents had me, they were both very early in their professional careers. Mm-hmm. And so neither could really stay home to take care of me. Okay. And so my dad asked his parents, who were by that point retired, to come over and take care of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and initially he told them to speak Chinese to me, as a lot of Chinese American families do. Yeah. But they were, they yeah. interestingly refused. They wanted to practice their English on me. Yeah, it's, so, I've noticed that either one or the other. Exactly. So for me, it was my mother who wanted to, to teach the Spanish, mm-hmm. but I never really spoke English with her, whereas... Actually, one of our very close friends who also had children at the same exact time is kind of a parallel, but with the opposite. Uh, yeah. They would speak English with their mother so she could learn English. Ah. So, yeah, I mean, the outcomes are outcomes. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, but it is at least an interesting situation where around 6th or 7th grade, my level of, I guess, my level of th- th- thoughts that I had were so complex that I couldn't express them in Chinese anymore. Mm. So even though I know little Chinese, I yeah. couldn't communicate with my grandparents the same way that I wanted to. Okay, yeah. If, if anyone's ever learned a language, they could, I'm sure they could understand that. Definitely. Uh, so how do you identify then? So in a lot of ways, identify not necessarily with one race per se. I mean, I guess I am ethnically Chinese American, mm-hmm. but in a lot of ways, I find my identity to be kind of this miasma of many different facets and identities mm-hmm. that are kind of in a lot of ways inseparable. I consider myself to be ethnically Chinese American, but also culturally, admittedly, very westernized because I never mm-hmm. really spoke Chinese, um, even though I was very proud and still am proud of Chinese traditions when I was younger. In a lot of ways, I was never good at adhering to them the way my grandparents did or even my parents mm-hmm. did. Um, and I also consider myself a product of each of the states that I grew up in, which mm-hmm. are all very proud of their yeah. kids, like Indiana, I guess oh, it's but like yes. Texas, they're all very, we're Texans, mm-hmm. and Alaska, it's like, we're very proud of who we are. Mm-hmm. So I definitely always had a strong attraction to the geographic location that I've lived in. Yeah, these very disparate areas exactly. that are very spread out. And you're right, they do form a triangle. I don't know if your parents talk about this exactly, but when they first got here, mm-hmm. from wherever they came from, uh, did they ever communicate any experience of their acculturation, how yeah, they adapted definitely. To, to the American culture? Definitely. So on my dad's side, when he first came over, he faced a lot of troubles as an international, as an international student. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of discrimination, and this was in the 80s, oh, um, yeah. during the Reagan years, and at the time there was still a lot of negative sentiment against um, international students coming over to at the time. I don't think the, the, the jargon and the, and the rhetoric is the same. Back then they were still rallying against immigrants taking U.S. jobs. And so mm-hmm. for him it was very hard to find jobs until he became a naturalized citizen and joined the military. Mm-hmm. And then for my mom, even though her parents were one generation removed, having come over from China when she was, before she was even born, mm-hmm. um, my mom found that there were a lot of, especially in the 70s and 80s, still very strict racial and ethnic boundaries in New York City, mm. where she grew up. And it wasn't until she got to college that she managed to kind of break down those boundaries. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of college, is that it really allows that. College is kind of a microcosm for the Absolutely. utopian integration, cultural integration. Absolutely. I think that's really cool. So are there any famous people from Alaska? Besides Sa- yourself. Oh, Sarah Palin. <laughs> we all know yes, Sarah Palin. indeed. Hockey indeed. mom. <laughs> Hockey mom, indeed, indeed. She was um, our governor for a couple of years, from 06 to 08. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was, at the time, so popular. She was so down to earth. And then around 08, I think the national attention and politics must have just, you know, messed up. I think they did mess up her life in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. The media got onto her family. And yeah. I disagree strongly with her, pol- disagree strongly with her politics, but... Nevertheless, the media was relentless on her family. Mm. Um, she had to buy like thirty foot tall hedge walls to protect her house from yeah. the media onslaughts, and she had a reality show. But that oh, Jesus! Out. Yeah. yeah, and her kids ended up in a couple of domestic abuse um, spats with the mm-hmm. courts, and um, eventually she became kind of the pariah mm. of, uh, of Alaska. So whenever Alaskans go out, unless they're really Palin fans. Mm-hmm. The first thing people talk to us about is, at least for the first few years after 08, Sarah mm-hmm. Palin. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of similar. It's like when we both went to Paris, I'm assuming that people, the first thing they would say to you is Trump. Oh, yeah. But absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, man. Okay, so one last thing before we go. Sure. Is something I like to bring up here is stereotypes. Mm-hmm. And we kind of debunk them or validate them depending on uh, what's real and what's not. 
So what are stereotypes from Alaska? Or you can go into Texas too, yeah. or even Indiana, or yeah. anywhere else that you're familiar with. And let's see if we can hack them. I think across all three states, there is a sentiment or a stereotype that like people from red states or rural states, both the liberal and conservative people from those states, are either dumb or uneducated. Mm -hmm. And while it is true that there's less educational opportunities in a lot of more rural or conservative states than there are concentrated in coastal, more liberal states, the people there are still as human and down to earth mm -hmm. as anyone else in the country. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one stereotype that could be debunked. I think another one is that Alaskans all are outdoorsy mm -hmm. and they all love hunting and all love fishing. I would say most do, but there are a couple of people who don't. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I was kind of like that, but then as I grew up, I became more accustomed to it. Okay. Yeah. The first one, the first point that you mentioned is very important, especially since we're on, since we're in a college and the colleges mm -hmm. are quite liberal. So usually we get very negative ideas of what the other side looks like. Definitely. So it's good to talk about that. Absolutely. I think that if I hadn't grown up in those three states, I wouldn't have known how to dialogue with people of different political beliefs. Yeah, that's very important. I'm glad that you're, you're able to do that. I think that makes you even a stronger SGA, SGA candidate. And Thank you. I don't want to say politician. But <laughs> statesman. Litigator. Not litigator. Oh, whatever. Statesman does, is a great word to just say that. All right, and actually, bonus round here. Okay. Let's talk about the healthcare system in Alaska because sure. that kind of epitomizes the the fact that distance between and access to mm -hmm. to hospitals and stuff like that, especially if you're having children. Absolutely, it it makes a I would think it would make a significant oh, impact. It does. It does. It does. So, with the Alaskan health system, we do have kind of corporatized hospitals in the same way that a lot of other states do. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that a lot of times our physicians are asked to either fly out to smaller villages to provide care or um, in emergency situations, you'll be able to fly into the city. Mm -hmm. So for example, say that there's um, an, an emergency situation in a small village, usually what happens is the first responder will be a state trooper. Mm -hmm. um, and then next, if it's bad enough and there's time, um, usually a hospital will send out a helicopter to pick up the patient and they'll be flown in for a couple hours into, yeah. into Anchorage or, another, or the next major mm -hmm. village or town with a functioning medical facility. Um, and then in terms of routine checkups, you often see you know physicians go out into smaller towns to provide care, mm -hmm. especially the care where there's no specialists. So for example, my father, he's an ophthalmologist, and mm -hmm. so he would often go to Valdez, which is a town on the other side of Prince William Sound. Mm -hmm. um, he would have to drive there or fly there. It must take a while. Alaska's yeah. Alaska's huge. Oh, it's huge. Oh, definitely. Oh, man. Definitely. Um, and the thing about Alaska, too, is that because it's so far off, a lot of the high-level treatment centers for stuff like advanced cancers aren't actually yeah. there. So people have to go to Seattle or California. Oh, like yeah, Washington. To, exactly. Okay, yeah. To get care. Hmm. That must be terrible in the case of an uh, emergency such as a stroke and just a lot, of, a lot of pathologies and disorders where time really matters. Absolutely. In between, you know, the initial onset and, and the actual commencement of the treatment. Dang. I wonder how they motivate uh, trainees to go towards Alaska. Yeah, so I know that at least for the Pacific Northwest, so... Washington, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Montana, those kind of states there. There's a program at the University of Washington called WAMI, um, W-A-M-I, and basically it encourages physicians to, or even medical students, to basically promise that whenever they um, come out of med school, they'll go to a rural village or town mm -hmm. in these states to practice medicine for a few years on okay. condition of um, they would get like their tuition like subsidized when they were at UW med school. That's perfect. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that should be incentive enough. I mean, yeah, there's the Army Scholarship, which mm -hmm. does something very, a little bit similar. You know, they give you some money and you have to serve for four years. Money is a very powerful incentive in Absolutely. America. Yeah. And especially, it is better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> especially when debt is brought into question. Absolutely. Well, anyway, it was great having you on our show today, talking about Alaska and, yeah, and various other countries. Thank you. Thank you. We learned a lot and uh, looking forward to whatever the future holds. Thank you. Same to you. All right, this has been Rice and Beans Episode 2. Thanks for tuning in again, everyone. And don't forget to check out our weekly Spotify playlist. There are some bangers there. Peace out.